Bella Salon and Day Spa, located at 41 West Main Street in Northeast Pennsylvania, proudly supports Chautauqua Sunrise and its volunteers. More information at bellasalonanddayspa.net. Funding is provided by a grant from New York State Senator Catherine M. Young, representing Western New York's 57th District with a local office in Olean. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. From the Access Channel 5 studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Channel 5. Continuing the traditions of Senior Report, we are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week, countywide, from 9 to 10 a.m. Join us by calling in line, emailing us, or checking out our social media. And now, from the Channel 5 studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. I'm Doc Hamels, and we have another wonderful educational show for you today. Little play on words there. And uh, I want to welcome you to come on, sit down, relax. Uh, uh, what we're going to talk about today is of interest to many people these days. And uh, some things I want to share with you that's going around in the community and so forth. But first of all, I want to uh, wish uh, Happy Easter to all my friends and, and, and those that are celebrating Passover this, this week. Uh, it's, a, it's a little cold, but uh, at least we're uh, out of the, the minus uh, degrees. I was thinking about this the other day. It's about, right now it's 38 degrees warm. Well, there's my little buddy for Easter. Thank you. Uh, it's 38 degrees warmer than when we came back from uh, um, California a while back. It was minus 10 that night. And it's like 28 now, so... It's, it's, we're really quite warm compared to what it's been. But anyways, uh, have a great holiday, everyone, regardless of how you celebrate it. And I know that the weather is, is uh, starting to warm up here, and the birds are back. I saw a crocus, my one and only crocus. I don't know how anybody can have one crocus, but we have one. And then all the rest, I don't know, the birds or squirrels ate the bulbs or something. I um, want to extend a happy birthday to my sister-in-law, Peg Hamels. Uh, she'll be celebrating her birthday today. And if you have a birthday that you want to announce or an anniversary, if you have a special event for your organization, give us a call here at the studio at 753-5225. You can Twitter us, tweet us, that's the same thing. Uh, Facebook us, you can text us, you can do all that sort of thing, or you can just walk into the studio, hand us a piece of paper, and we'll announce it for you. It's free of charge, and we're happy to share that with you. Uh, speaking of sharing and uh, information, I, I really want to share something with you, and it's a big thank you to the Jamestown Gazette. And oh, I know Chris has a, has a screen on this. There we go. Um, well, Pickett, one of the uh, writers uh, from Jamestown Gazette, contacted us a while back and said we'd, we'd like to do uh, a spread on you. And I said, really? And uh, if you haven't picked this up, it's quite an honor, and I'm humbled that they were. Uh, thinking that we were important enough to put on their uh, front page this week. So uh, thank you to the Jamestown Gazette and in kind, I invited them to come on the show in September. So the folks will be coming in, we'll have a little chat with them and find out what makes them tick and all the good work that they do. Um, it's really fascinating to, uh, to collaborate with various media here in the county, whether it's radio, TV, or print form. And uh, I think everybody is pretty much on the same page. We're trying to get information out to all of you and to talk about what's going on here in the county. And uh, one of the biggest things is we can see on a daily basis is communication, 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 is how do we share information and get the truth. And uh, although the internet is a wonderful experience uh, for many of us, it's not necessarily the place that you want to get your information. So that's why a lot of times we try to bring in here at, 
at Chautauqua Sunrise, we try to bring in folks that are experts or in the know about certain topics, and then we can share it with you, and you can call in, ask a question, learn more. Rather than look, looking something up on the internet in, you know, sort of way off there in the distance as far as it's, is this true or not, and so forth. Um, so anyways, that was a nice honor, and we're happy to uh, have been the recipient of that honor. Okay, moving right along, let's see what else we got here. We have uh, some announcements to go here, and let's go to the Diamond Dinner. Uh, let's see, this is April 25th at the Anthony M. Hotel. The uh, Child Advocacy Program, Janet McDermott, who was on the show a while back, their agency is having a very, very special auction and dinner, and uh, I will be the MC that evening. And I'm looking forward to meeting all the folks that will be attending there. And of course, the proceeds will be going to that great program of supporting children and trying to alleviate and wipe out uh, child abuse, especially sexual child abuse. So thank you, Chris, for bringing that up. Then we have another uh, event that uh, is uh, kind of interesting, Death Over Dinner. And I talked about this last week. And this is through the Chautauqua County Hospice Program. And this is uh, a mature discussion about uh, how we're going to um, prepare for our own end, our own passing, and are, are we prepared and are, are we having all of our affairs in order in the event that something catastrophic were to happen out of the clear blue? And people always think, well, that's for people of a certain age, and that's simply not true. If you look in the papers, it, it, it can be any one of us at any given time. And so they are encouraging us to get together, and there's the dates, and there's all the way from Findlay Lake up to uh, North Harmony area and so forth and all places in between uh, to get together. Dinner's $5 and contact those folks. And I know it's kind of a touchy subject, but you know what? Be prepared and uh, families that are prepared, it's a lot easier when the time comes. All right, on a little cheerier note, today at 10 o'clock, about, uh, I don't know what it is, 45 minutes from now, the uh, Children's Safety Education Village will be kicking off their annual Easter Carnival. I will be there, so if you happen to come over and, and you see me, come on over and say hi. I'll be helping out. I'm not exactly sure what Terry Kinberg has me doing, but uh, I'm sort of one of those floater all-purpose people. But that'll be going on until 1 o'clock. You might say, well, it's a little chilly out there. Come on. It's going to be like uh, above freezing, bundle up the kiddies, grandkids, whatever. It's a couple dollars to get in. They have the touch a touch a truck program where they got all kinds of cool vehicles there and the kids can get in there I'm told and climb behind the steering wheel yeah and uh, it's going to run till as I said from now, about 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock it's over in Route 394 uh, it's on the same property as the Hughes Educational Center the Bosey Center there right in Nashville so check it out lots of fun at the Children's Educational Village uh, Easter Carnival then we're on a skeleton crew here today because these, one of these guys is uh, vacationing down in uh, south of the border. There he is, uh, Randy. You should be with him. Uh, there's uh, Jeff Zook, our head engineer, in the middle on his bike, and his brother to the, let's see, our right in the blue. And I'm not exactly sure who the other person is, but I believe they're in Mexico City vacationing and visiting family. So hi, Jeff and Galen. They're getting ready for their ride for Roswell in, is it July? June. June. Okay. Too many days to remember. But anyways, happy that they're getting some time off and enjoying the warm weather. Okay. Lots of fun. Okay. What else we got going on here? All kinds of things. Okay. I had an occasion to stop at the Grape Discovery Center yesterday, and I was talking with Christina McCain, the executive director. And she tells me they've got a new event. We don't have a slide for this. I just have information right now. But on, listen to this. is really kind of cool. April 19th, let me get my glasses on here, from 2 to 4, they are going to have a beach glass jewelry, jewelry class, that's hard to say, jewelry class, while wine tasting. I guess kind of interesting. So you make jewelry and drink wine at the Grape Discovery Center on April 19th from 2 to 4, and they have an instructor, uh, Chris French. It's $40 a person, and the question is, are you a beach Glass collector, want to turn those treasures into wonderful jewelry. And it's just a lot of fun, and they're doing all kinds of neat programs over there. So April 19th at your local uh, Grape Discovery Center right here in 
uh, our region in Westfield over on Route 20, just uh, between Westfield and Ripley. Great place, in, uh, and they have lots of nice gifts and so forth. We have the Mayville, Westfield Mayville Rotary Auction coming up on May 16th. And if you haven't been to that event, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's $10 to, to get in. It includes a, a dinner, chicken dinner, and a chance to win $500. That's just for the $10 ticket. All right, you can win $500, you get a barbecue dinner, and a chance to, to raise your hand and, and uh, uh, what's the word I want to say? Uh, I'm running out. You get to bid. That's right. I get these brain freezes at 9 o'clock in the morning. I had trouble a few, couple weeks ago with the word hospitable. Okay. Uh, you get to bid on the various auction items. And also they have a silent auction where you bid and you walk along and you write down your bids on the little sheets. And uh, the Westwood Mayville Rotary Club, like many of our other organizations in the area, just do great work for our communities and the proceeds go to supporting scholarships and the food pantries and sending kids to camp and all kinds of great things. So that's coming up. I'm just checking on my notes here. Okay, um, this next item is kind of fun. Uh, if you don't get a chance to watch this show live, like Saturday mornings, and if you don't get a chance to catch us during the week once it's being broadcast and rebroadcast, um, you have an opportunity. You can go out on YouTube, and if you don't know what that is, it's, it's a website, and uh, you can go in there and do a little search and push your talk with Sunrise, and all of our shows to date, the day would be the, let me see if I got this right, Chris, this would be our 40th show, and uh, you can click on the show that you like. We sh we, it shows up like a little stream of different little pictures of all the guests that have been on the show since July. And uh, you can click on there and watch the whole show from anywhere in the world. And uh, I have been in contact with people that watch the show from Africa over to California to the, to the Netherlands and so forth. People that have uh, connected with us by going to Chautauqua Sunrise on Facebook, click like, and they get our uh, various articles and uh, notifications and also if you're if you're not interested in that just go to YouTube and look it up now the reason why I bring it up because our guest today is Dr. Lauren Ormsby and she's going to be interested to know some information about this so we're going to get her on in a second but if you go to YouTube every time someone clicks on there and there I think this is how it works if you are a unique viewer in other words this is your first time to see it it clicks one one viewer and uh, I just wanted to let you know that to date on our 40 shows, uh, every time of, oh, I got the voice here, the, the expert here, he says every time you view the page, uh, it counts one. So if you, if, you, if you like a show, watch it 100 times and it'll show up 100 clicks up on the like so you'll see you know so many viewers well anyways I just thought you might like to know that up to date that we have over 2,200 views of the show which tells me that folks are looking at it on YouTube or my dad's been watching a lot of the shows regularly and keeps looking at them I'm not sure which so anyways so our top five shows listen to this Steve Gustafson uh, with 10,000 maniacs and the Zook brothers are at 125 uh, excuse me 112 views then in, in fourth place, Aaron Howenstein from the uh, Westfield Library, Patterson Library is 123. Uh, Rick Mascaro, who is here with the uh, Community Theater, 124. John Wolf, this came out of nowhere when he talked about the Cushing Award, uh, 136 views. And Lauren Ormsby is still our leading uh, guest here with 143 views. Wow. So anyways, uh, so we have our number one uh, guest here on the show coming up. We're going to take a little break and we're going to be right back with you with Dr. Lauren Ormsby talking about uh, Common Core and all that good stuff. Stick around. I've got a job to do today. I've got a job to do today. Your donations to Goodwill fund job training programs right in your community. Feels good to start fresh, right? Sure does. And like that, you're a job creator. 
Okay, and uh, we're back, and I want to remind you that if at any time you want to give us a call, and it doesn't have to be necessarily about what we're talking about, if there's something on your mind that you want to share, we may or may not be able to respond to it, but we're certainly uh, open to listen to what you have to say, and of course, if you have any special event going on in your family. So right now, I just want to frame the discussion. Uh, a while back, I don't even remember what it was. I probably could look it up right now. It was our 15th show, so whenever that was, probably late summer. Uh, Dr. Ormsby came on the show, and we were talking about Common Core and, and discussing all this sort of thing, because it's been kind of a topic that you see in the papers and Facebook. A lot of people have opinions on this sort of thing. and. Uh, this reminds me a lot when uh, I was superintendent where we were talking a lot about the standards in New York State and everybody was, ah, the sky is falling and all this stuff and somehow or another we managed to get through all of that and it seems like it, uh, education goes through cycles. I remember, and this is a true story, I'm not making this up, I think I was in maybe fourth or fifth grade and I was uh, progressing through the grades and they came out with something called, and some of you will remember this, called the new math. And my brother was in the class that started the new math, and my parents were all up in arms. And they just, they, you know, what is this? And, uh, you know, all set theory and all this jazz. Well, it was just a different approach to math. And I gotta tell you, my brother's done okay. <laughs> He's done very, very well for himself. He's a high-ranking uh, administrator over at General Motors, and he uses mathematics every day. And so whatever it was, it didn't hurt him, didn't kill him. And to this day, he's been very successful. So I know a lot of people had to learn that new math, and uh, they just had to kind of adjust to it. So that's what this topic is going to be all about today, is adjusting, learning about uh, what the this Think Common Core is, and we're going to be talking about a little bit about the assessments and curriculum and so forth. But the reason why I want to talk about it, because it's a hot topic and it's confusing, and I know Lauren is very clear about the topic. And uh, so, let's welcome you onto the show before I do the whole show by myself, because that's not the, the goal here. So, how are you? Welcome. It's always good to see you. <coughs> Thank you. And um, you made it through the winter months? We survived. It was a long winter, <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> I warned you about that, didn't I? I mm -hmm. said you're not going to, you're not going to sleep much during. Oh man, this, this calling snow days is probably one of the most stressful things. Can you share that with our viewers? Because a lot of people have no idea what the life of a superintendent is well, in the Northeast. <laughs> fortunately, my husband is uh, loves the Weather Channel. Mm -hmm. He watches it often, so the Weather Channel comes on at around seven o'clock the night before and you're constantly trying to check every single different weather station to see if there might be a different prediction. Mm -hmm. And then you pretend to go to sleep, and then you wake up every hour with the nightmare. You know this, the uh, nightmare. So that's that <laughs> the ni <laughs> my alarm's not gonna go off, right? The, my alarm's not gonna go off. To, it's gonna be eight o'clock, the, the buses are all gonna be on the roads, and I missed mm -hmm. the opportunity to call the snow day that was really needed to happen. So you set your alarm for three, mm -hmm. four, and then the phone calls start. Yep. And you start talking with each other. It's really hard because sometimes you look out the window and you see tons of snow, and sometimes you see nothing and there's just a prediction of it. So we survived. I know. Not my favorite season. My, the, the, my favorite story, and we'll get to Common Core in a second here, was uh, my, my very dear friend, the late Jack Scahill, called me up at 4.30 in the morning. He goes, good morning, sunshine. He's got this real gravelly voice. I go, oh, good morning, Curly, because he had no hair. And uh, I said, what's up? And he says, you're going to close school. And I'm looking out, and I go, why? It's not, not snowing. Not a flake in the air, right? He goes, mm -hmm. it's windy. It's a wind chill factor. He says, it's minus 20 below zero wind chill factor. And I go, okay, well, how am I supposed to figure that out? I live up on the, the escarpment in Ripley. He says, well, you got to go to the internet. You look up the, the wind chart. You look at the temperature, do this multiplication thing. I don't wake up well at 4.30 in the morning to begin with, so there I am, my wife's going, like, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure out the wind chill factor here. So then I, I had no idea what the wind is. It's the new math. It's the new, <laughs> yes, it's the new math. And so I, I got the figure that, you know, what the temperature is, and if you get a certain wind speed. So I, to this day, have no idea what the wind chill factor was. I simply waited and waited, and then when everybody else closed, I said, well, we got to be in the same wind direction. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's. They made us a chart now. Oh, I know. aren't you and, lucky? Yeah, well, finally somebody figured that out, mm -hmm. knew, 
Yeah, you, look, you look for the temperature, and then you look for the wind speed, and yeah. you match it down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, congratulations! You made it through your first major long winter, and it Ooh. was a doozy. Yeah. And it, do you have any? Has uh, it ended yet? I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't. I think after it April first, they allow you All to right. do something. For, yeah. Is it called emergency closing? I was say, you said the Easter come down. It's cold. Mm. Forty degrees is balmy for us. <laughs> Okay, Lauren, I don't think everybody knows much about you. I know you're, you don't hail from here originally, this mm -hmm. area, so where are you from? Yeah, I'm, I moved here in 1996 mm -hmm. from Rochester, New York. Grew up in um, Penfield. And so you're used to tough winters up there, so mm -hmm. it's no big deal. Yep. So Penfield? Yeah, and um, went to college at Fredonia State, mm -hmm. met my husband, and we have three children. Luke Lawson and Layton, they're 12. They're all boys, I can seven. see from three. pictures. They're yes, <laughs> three boys. I have my middle child broke both of his wrists in phys ed this oh, week. Oh, so is he the one they call the boss man? Or boss man, he's boss the boss, man. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, he broke his wrists on Monday, so it's been an interesting week, oh, but boy. they're very active, um, mm -hmm. real fun. Good. Yep. And uh, you were a teacher at one time? Yep, I um, was a special education. Mm -hmm. well, actually, I was a teaching assistant while mm -hmm. I was um, getting my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And then a special education teacher uh, for eight years at Ripley. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. And now you are school superintendent. Mm -hmm. Principal. And you're, you're still smiling and mm -hmm. getting up every morning and going to work. Yep. <laughs> Lauren, last time we got together, we talked about, in general, Common Core. And I... When I got done with the show, I thought, you know, this just seems like another version to me of what we've already done and already done and already done. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to keep saying it over and over again, but um, I remember various versions where we had to update things and, 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 and there was a purpose. And it seemed to me the United States was falling behind many of the, 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 the uh, what's the word I want to say, more of the industrial countries, mm -hmm. the ones that were progressive because of the lack of math and uh, communication skills and language arts and so forth. I saw that you go to some of the cities and they had a gr graduation rate of like 65 percent mm -hmm. and that's not here in the, out in the county yeah. around here. I mean think we're, we're more like close to 90 percent and there's reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the nation as a whole was saying, hey we can do better. Is that what this is about? Yeah, you know, from a systems perspective, if you're the person responsible for the education of students in the country, it is your, it's your duty to continually evaluate how students are doing and compared to other countries or, you know, within, even within the states, to make sure that we're competitive, to make sure we're moving our students forward and um, graduating students that are, you know, prepared to enter the workforce or be ready for college. And what they were finding was that's, that wasn't, that's not what was happening. Um, we talked last time, I think, a little bit about the imputed credit courses at uh, the college level. And what that means is that when you go to college, you take an assessment. And depending on how you do on that assessment, you may be assigned to um, basically non, you pay for them, but they're non-credit courses and they're remedial math and English language arts courses to so support. So you got to beef up your skills yeah. just to keep on just going. Just to be ready to go to college. I remember hearing that and I, and I didn't understand what that was because I'm thinking like, well, if you get accepted into college, you certainly must have the skills and that's just not the case in no, some cases. No, and so they were looking at that data as well and the number of students that were required to take those courses was increasing. Mm -hmm. So you could look at that two ways, either, you know, we, our students, our education system isn't rigorous enough. Or you could look at it and say that um, we need to change the way we're preparing our students so that the skills that they're learning in, in high school are matching those of college. And so they were maybe they weren't, uh, they were out of sync somehow. Out of sync, yeah. 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 So maybe, or maybe a combination of both. Now when I was reading about this a little bit, this isn't just preparing students for college, but mm -hmm. preparing them for the, world of work as well. I mean, that includes college, but this could also be for folks that are going into vocational trades and so forth, mm -hmm. technical trades. Yeah, absolutely. How does that, how does that uh, translate for well, those if you, folks? Well, if you think about it, if you need, if when you go to college, if you need to take um, remedial math and English language arts communication skills courses, those are the skills you need when you go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. So students that don't have those skills will struggle with communication and, you know, mathematics and any kind of um, practical application of those subjects. Yeah, um, you know, 
I worked for BOCES for 29 years, and, and many of those years I was an administrator, and I was the administrator over the career in tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just an ongoing, and, and I hear that it still is, I'm not sure to what degree, but it's like, don't you folks out there in TV land get it? Students that are in the technical trades are using high level technical math and yeah. communication skills and the ability to read technical uh, written material and they need these skills to be the engineers, the, the plumbers, electricians mm -hmm. and people say well what's the deal with any of those? <laughs> go fix a car sometime or go you know try to figure out how a furnace works and things like that and, or just go in the industrial commercial side of any of these fields well, and it's incredible. You and I probably know very well about this topic but remember I think it was probably almost 10, 10 years ago when they, s they determined that there was a disconnect between the English language arts and math skills that students were getting in CTE right. and or I'm sorry in um, their home schools mm -hmm. and in CTE right. and so the state made this transition and they started integrating so remember how you could get a credit right. they changed it so that you didn't need to take that extra um, yeah, it was right. It was science in there. and math credit. They integrated it into the career and technical skills so that they would be more relevant to the work that they were right. doing. So this is that's just one example of a shift that's happened. Why this shift is um, so upsetting to everyone is is interesting. You're right, and I've seen a lot of jokes and and, and postings about it, and I just kind of scratch my head and thinking like, well, if people are acting like this, they're to me anyways, and, 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 I, and I'm not a professional on this particular topic, I'm not an expert, but it would seem to me, this, I've heard the same old things before about these transitions, that they don't be, people don't have enough information, and so they get a little piece of, of naysaying or somebody complaining, and then they twist it and turn it and so forth. And uh, I, I think people need to realize that this isn't just Chautauqua County, New York State, this is across the United States. 43 states, if I'm not mistaken from what I read, mm -hmm. have adopted the, the Common Core program. Yeah. Where they're saying, we believe, well you tell me, what does that mean? What, what is the Common Core? What, what are the beliefs of that? Well, Common Core standards are a consistent set of standards that um, start with, the way they were written is that they started with what a student would need to be leaving high school with, what were the skills in e English language arts and math that the students would need to leave with, and then they scaffolded them back, mm -hmm. almost like steps, all the way down to pre-kindergarten, so that um, teachers and parents would have a road map of, e of which skills and what knowledge students would need to have um, when they got to college. So it tells you at each grade level. Now why that's good for us in our country is that um, previously everyone had their own standards. And you could still see that if you, you do a search for um, you know music or physical education. Every state has different standards. So students moving from state to state may, may or may not have had the same the same thing as other students. So this really helps us to um, can make comparisons across state. We could see how our students are doing um, in our country um, easier. That doesn't seem like an unreasonable request. It doesn't seem like an unreasonable target for a nation to have a unified curriculum. I don't think that if anyone... Or not curriculum, but standards, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I don't think if you put the standards in front of anyone, and specifically said which one of these are upsetting, people would be able to identify that. I think the confusion is coming from what we talked about last time I was on the show, the difference between the Common Core Standards, which very simply say what a student should know and be able to do, and the Common Core Curriculum, mm -hmm. which is a curriculum that was offered by New York State um, that they provided for us to say this is aligned to the standards to kind of show us what how how different it was. Um, so I think people get those two things confused and that's where you hear a lot of the mm -hmm. um, frustration. They're, they're telling us what, you know, what to say and how to teach. Okay, hold on a second. We've got a question here and I'm, I'm trying to interpret it. Was there any thought given about the amount of adult learners in remedial classes? I'm assuming that maybe at the college level? So when, when adults are, are applying to go to college, was there anything about what oh, what was their position they, in all this, you know? Or are they asking um, if the adult learners 
statistics are in that number of oh it could be so yeah. maybe because there was an increase oh, I see. maybe they're yeah. saying if there's an increase in adult learners um, I don't I don't know that for sure mm -hmm. um, when the data is presented to us um, and I believe you can look it up on engage New York mm -hmm. so that would be a good resource I would have to check that out and see what that's an interesting point though okay mm -hmm. um, as far as resources go is there a particular website that people can go to to talk about Common Core? Yeah, Engage New York. Engage New York. Com. Okay, that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. E N G A G E N Y dot com. com. Okay. And on that website, you can um, download the standards, look at the state um, assessment guides, you can um, find examples of Common Core lessons, uh, video, and the curriculum is there, and it's all uh, free. Okay, so let's rewind the tape a little bit. So the United States says we need to have common standards so that the kid in Alaska, the kid in Florida, the kid in Maine, and the kid in, in Ripley, New York, they're all shooting for the same targets. Mm -hmm. Because we as a nation are moving forward and we, and we as 43 states, I think it was 43 governors and commissioners of education got together from what I was reading. And um, they all said these are the things that we deem important and we accept it in 43 are moving forward. Yes. Okay. Then New York State uh, said we're one of those players and then they began to gather who to, to develop curriculum, curricula. So they started the Network Team Institute which is a professional development opportunity in Albany mm -hmm. and every school district had so many seats if you will mm -hmm. and um, in the first year or so, we really spent a lot of time learning about the standards, about uh, curriculum design, and um, learning how to do, how to make the shifts in, the, in, learning about the Common Core shifts and how to implement them in our schools. Mm -hmm. That ha took about, I, th I think it was about two years. So there's a lot of planning and time that's gone into mm -hmm. this. Isn't just something that came out of nowhere. Yeah, and so then as time went on, um, school districts and were finding that it was very difficult to write the curriculum and um, just to really know how to do it and how to do it well. And at, at that point, there was an RFP from the state looking for uh, a contract for someone to write curriculum so that we would have a really good model to look at. So an RFP being a proposal? A proposal. A request for proposals. Correct. Suggest who, who wants to do this and mm -hmm. how much it's going to cost. Yeah. Okay. Let's just stop one second and we'll come back to this, that RFP, if you will. Curriculum is what? Viewers are watching right now. That's maybe a term that's sort of nebulous. What do we mean by curriculum? Curriculum are the, it's the stuff. It's the stuff. It's what the are we stuff. It's, the, it's the materials and the lessons and resources that you use to teach the standards in your school. And this comes out in a booklet form or where, how does a teacher? Well, there's, I mean, if, if you've work? ever, if you've seen a child's textbook in mm -hmm. previous years, it would look like a, um, a textbook with a teacher's edition. Um, sometimes it comes in a packet of, of worksheets. Mm -hmm. um, teacher created materials can look like anything. It could be um, written lesson plans that. So it's nothing new. No. It's th we've had these around for some time. No. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's a so it's a guide. It's this is this is what we're proposing as curriculum to get to the standard yeah. to make the and country it'll identify better. what the standards are mm -hmm. and then the the activities that you're going to do in your classroom okay. to reach those standards All right. so let's now go back to where you were saying so after a couple of years it was difficult and they they did a request for companies to write the curriculum mm -hmm. or? okay and they selected uh, two comp or three companies mm -hmm. um, to do that work and the rest is history. I mean, districts had the option. They could um, adopt, ad adopt the, completely adopt the curriculum that they selected. They could adapt it, which means that you're going to take the curriculum and you're going to um, look at your own district and see how it fits in with your own district and your, um, your current curriculum, or ignore it. And if you ignored it, that meant that you were going to continue working towards aligning your curriculum to the new standards on your own. Okay. A uh, point of interest, and Chris, maybe we can put up a slide on this as we go along. EngageNewYork.org? Oh, it's dot org. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, whoop, is he fast or what? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. You know, there, it's, it's always hard to remember, is it a dot cor org dot com? I always say dot, uh, just is it default bid? dot com. Is it bid or yellow? I, I uh -huh. can't remember these words. Yeah. 
Okay, so you're, you're painting a very, very good, clear picture to me, and I hope the folks that are watching the show, if you have any questions, you can give Lauren a call here at 753-5225 or text us or Twitter us, uh, however, and uh, don't be bashful. You don't have to identify yourself. Uh, if you have a real question, maybe she can answer it. You know, We can't answer all the questions, but we try. Um, you brought a book here today that I think is kind of relevant to uh, the discussion. So yeah. tell us well, about an that. Anyone that knows me, or you can ask Mary Swanson, I always have a book with me. Okay. And I brought a book last time. So I have a um, collection of antique textbooks. And when I was thinking about our discussion today, I was digging through them last night and thinking about why, you know, how things have changed. This is a standard arithmetic. Imagine that, standard. Textbook. <laughs> it's not my nicest one, but... Well, some of my friends my, are like that. I don't, I've got I, great I, friends. They don't necessarily like all that. I agree. collect antique text, so where'd you get textbooks. This book? Um, my husband feeds my collection. <laughs> so thank you, Terry. Um, this is an 1892 uh, math book. And when I was looking through it, I was, I was drawn to this page. Okay, so they're, they're review exercises for fractions. And here's a couple of the questions. Okay, I'm ready. Let's see if I can ready? figure it out. A ma well, I don't know. This is. It might take a little while. A man has I'm passed. All right, a man has three creditors. Three creditors. To the first, he owes one thousand three hundred sixty dollars and fifty cents, but it says one half because this is a fraction question. To the second, one thousand eighty-seven and a quarter, and to the third, eight hundred and seventy-six and three quarters. How much was the last one? Eight hundred and seventy-six dollars and three quarters. Three quarters. See, that's a that's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Back then, we would talk like that, but talk. nowadays, you say seventy five cents. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I got gotcha. you. The man fails, and the creditor sees all of his property, which mm -hmm. amounts to only two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. How much should each creditor receive? Holy mackerel! Mm -hmm. You're right. It will take me. I a know. While. <laughs> so, the point is, there's another question here. Um, if a miller takes one eighth for toll and a bushel of wheat produces 40 pounds of flour, how many bushels must be carried to the mill to obtain 196 pounds of flour or one barrel? Now, if you were on Facebook right now, they would say two rubber ducks plus a platypus minus a uh, Canadian change. Mm -hmm. They would make up some cockamamie answer because they'd make fun of it. Yeah. That's real world stuff. So it, made me, it just made me think, you know, and then the rest of them talk about being a merchant and trading cloth and your boat sailing. So, or cutting cords of wood. Mm -hmm. So it just made me think that, you know, throughout history, we've had to change our curriculum. We've had to change our assessments to match the needs of society. In 1892, we needed our young people to be able to do that type of thinking. It was important. <laughs> and so um, it, it really is our duty as educators to make sure that our assessments align with the rigor of our current society and if we're giving out tests just to move to the assessment piece if we're giving assessments that have a ceiling so in what I mean by that is that every student can get a hundred then it's really not telling us anything about you know our students um, where we, we, we it's not helping us get our students move them forward and get them to where we need to go we need to like create an assessment that is very rigorous that'll tell us that'll show us that our students are ready for college and career. It's, a, it's yeah, uh, it, it's sort of a sorting, mm -hmm. and it sort of lets you know where you need to work a little harder, mm -hmm. and it's not a scary thing, maybe. Yeah. And that uh, as educators, as parents, as general uh, community members, we're trying to improve, but, but like you say, if everybody passes, it gets 100, we assume everything's fine. And I think that is a little bit of the stress. I mean, if you think about it, anytime you're going to implement some new standards then um, and provide a new test, obviously if we're just starting to teach this, it's going to take several years for us to get to where we feel comfortable um, that the assessment is, is truly an assessment of what we have taught these students. Okay. If that now, makes any sense. It does, to me, at this point. But here's the question I have right now. People have been hearing assessment, assessment, assessment. Um, what do you mean by assessment? When I think of the assessment and why it's important to our school district and our community and our mm -hmm. society, it's, because it's basically a school district's report card. It's almost like your annual checkup. When you go to the doctor, you go to the doctor, they check your blood pressure, 
they, I got in this debate with my, well, I tried to stay out of the debate with my husband, but <laughs> when you go to the doctor, they check your weight and yes, they check your heart. Yes, yes. And so he felt at, at, at your age, like, what difference does that really make? Right. So, it, but if you think about your annual checkup, what that is, is that is your, it, it kind of, for the year, it's your annual review. Yeah. It tells you where you are. Snapshot. And so, and you need that for your, it, it kind of guides your decision making. Well, so if I go to the doctor and I weigh 10 pounds more than I did last time, mm -hmm. in my head I'm saying, okay, this is, my, this is my plan. I'm going to run more. I'm going to eat less. So mm -hmm. you, you start to make those decisions about your life. A school district as a superintendent, when I get those scores, I start to make my plans for my district. If I don't have a true assessment, if I don't have my annual checkup, how can I tell my school board, my community, how can I tell them how we're doing and where we're going? And what a really amazing piece of this that people never talk about is they changed, and this is, you pr might not know this, but they've changed the way they've reported assessments to districts. Mm -hmm. So they used to give you, um, they used to let base it, basic base it on student achievement. So did you get a three? Did you get a four? Did, what did you get a two? Now the, the information that they're giving us is they're t giving us a growth percentile. They're telling us how much each student grew. Oh. So now it's really not about students um, just reaching one cut point. Mm -hmm. They're gonna tell me in, in each grade level and overall as a school, did I make growth? So that is a really important shift because whether or not our students reach that proficiency level of three, my, what's most important to us is to know that all of the students are growing. And that's... It's a little different. Yeah, yeah. And that was a shift um, that came with the new Common Core assessments that people don't talk about. Okay, let's hold that thought. I've, I've, I've written a couple notes down here, okay. but we do have a caller. Can we take sure. a call? Mm -hmm. Good morning, caller. Good morning, this is Linda Spaulding. Uh, good good morning, morning, Dr. Lawrence. Hi. Good, hi, good, and good morning, Doc. It's great to see you on the show, and I really enjoyed your reading the uh, math problems mm -hmm. from from the uh, older man. Uh, was that Jimi Hendrix in the living room? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Should I call back? No, it, uh, maybe you're just a little too close to the TV. I'm not sure. I don't know. I've got it down low. I don't know. I'll put it down I'm lower. I'm still working on that math problem, by the way. I, it's going to take me a while. <laughs> 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 well, we learn to do things in our head, too, and to do things, you know, um, mentally. And I still, when I calculate, I use the calculator or the computer, but I always do it in my head, too. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with backups, and no, no. we're not necessarily uh, perfect. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great to be able to do that. I have a question um, for you, Dr. Lauren. I don't know if you want to answer it or address it, but what do you think of the charter school money coming out of public school funds when the charter schools do not have standards as high as the public school system? Mm. Hmm. Well, I, th I think saying that the um, charter schools don't have standards as high as the public school system, um, I don't know necessarily if, that, if that's true, like consistently across all of the charter schools. Um, my understand, like the, ex the charter schools that I'm familiar with, um, particularly you might have seen in the newspaper a lot, my name associated with expeditionary learning. Mm -hmm. Um, they follow the Common Core standards, and I, I guess I can't answer because I don't know that for sure. Um, well, I do. I do know one example now. I okay. don't know if this is true for all of the charter schools, but I do know in Buffalo, if they have a disrupt disruptive student, they can expel them. The public schools can't do that. But now that would be different than than the Common Core, right? That mm -hmm. that's a, more of a school policy versus the what what. Common Core in the curriculum, right? You know what I mean, Linda? You know, I, I don't know. I, I, they, they can do things the public school system cannot get away with. I mean, that's one example. Okay, because that's the way their charter was written, probably, mm -hmm. and, and so on. I think if my, my personal opinion is if they're going to take public school funds, they should have the exact same standards, or else they have their own money, like the private schools have their own money mm -hmm. and their own tuition. I mean, I think it's great to have alternatives and diversified education, 
but they should be able to fund it themselves. And a lot of your Christian schools do that. They fund it themselves. And have their um, own rules. Yeah. Right. 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 And I, I strongly believe in the public school system. I think it's absolutely necessary. Absolutely. I, yeah. I would I would just say that I think that um, if they aren't, that there are parents that are looking for that type of education, so maybe it's driven by that need, the fact that they're not using the Common Core Standards. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, we'll have to investigate mm -hmm. that one a little bit. Yep. If you find out, anybody, anybody finds the answer to that, I'll call it in. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that one. Mm -hmm. but, but what I'm saying is discipline and what we're talking about are like two different avenues in, yeah. in the school system. So I'm not sure if, you know, uh, disciplining a student really is related to the, the Common Core. But it does say, you know, that they can have some of their own uh, jurisdi uh, jurisdiction on discipline and things like that, different than New York State, which is very re regulated. In, 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 and the in state might have some requirements yeah. on yeah. that as well, charter schools. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you'd have to look, maybe check out engagenewyork.org and look because I, um, or the New York State Education website, um, they would have information about charter school requirements. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a requirement for the standards, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So I'd be guessing. Okay. So anything else, Lynn? Thanks for making us crazy here. <laughs> you got us on that one. Good question, though. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, Doug was a teacher in the public school system for many years, and I strongly believe in public education. So yep. we have to keep it going. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I wanted to uh, say a very happy Easter and uh, happy Passover to those of uh, those people who are celebrating it. I believe it was started last night. Mm -hmm. But uh, also there are services with the Chautauqua County Office for the Aging and of course the Senior Employment Program and the computer training that is free for, for, for beginners for seniors at sites in Dunkirk, Brackton, Westfield, and Jamestown. And there's a standard in our society to, to learn more about computers, right? Right. So th the, it really ties in with what we're talking about and keep yes. learning because mm -hmm. you just can't sit back and not know about computers these days. Computers are so much easier. There's so, I mean, if you, if you misspell a word, there's spell check. If you make a mistake, you press delete. I remember the olden days when it wasn't that easy. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a great weekend. Okay. And Thanks, thank Lynn. you for addressing my question. Okay. You're welcome. If we find out more, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Bye -bye. Okay. Well, and there you go. You know, computers and, and learning is never ending. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my dad's going to be 92, and he's he's awesome on the computer. He just loves it. Uh, he just has a mind for it, and he he'll ask me questions, or I'll show him a trick or two. And the next thing t time I come up to the house, he's he's applied that learning, and it's it's relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have another question that popped up here. Let's see if I can translate this one. How is it fair for grades on assessments count towards whoop, student grades if they should be meant for a school's checkup? Okay, that's. I'm so glad that that question came up. I didn't make that up. That came through on Twitter. That was something that I wanted to move to next, and, and that's what do those scores, what do we use those scores for? Yeah. And, and the reality is that this, this, and I can only speak, again, for my experience in my school district, Okay. but we do not use the scores. They do not go as far as a report card. Um, we feel obligated to report that to a parents. As a parent, I want to see how my child is doing um, across the grades and compared to peers in the state. Um, but the, we don't use those numbers. Um, they don't count against the students. That's the most important thing I think parents need to understand is that um, while we may make instructional decisions based on the scores as far as, you know, what we need to emphasize or re-examine uh, re or change, um, we do not use them. They're not held against students. Okay. And I think that's a, a myth that students have, too. I'm going to fail. The word failure, there's no such thing as a failure. See, I even wrote it down, so I'm going to cross it out. Yeah, and that's what's exciting about the Can't actual the, the growth scores that I talked mm -hmm. about. I mean, if a student, I can have a conversation with a student and be like, yes, you, you do have a two, okay? The proficiency level is a three. But let's look at this growth number here. Let's talk about how much growth you've made. Okay, I had a follow-up question in my earpiece here. Got it. Um, first of all, what grades are being tested? All grades? 
No, it's grades uh, three, basically three and up, three, three through eight. Three through eight. Mm -hmm. And what about high school? Those are being phased in. That's a whole nother okay. volume. But they're slowly phasing in assessments <coughs> and um, regents exams are starting to become aligned in Common Core. So grades three through eight, it's not like a regents exam that's a pass or fail. It's simply a growth indicator mm -hmm. and then an overall picture of the school district. Yeah. Okay. Now, as a superintendent, I was faced, I think it was like the third day a superintendent, I got a letter that says uh, your, your school is on a school of in need of improvement mm -hmm. because the students hadn't done well on one particular test. And I think there were four tests at the time, maybe. And we did extremely well in three, mm -hmm. and we were low in one. Yeah. And I couldn't trade two of those to make up for the one, or I tried mm -hmm. to negotiate. I, I did everything I could to get off that list. Yeah. And the problem was is that we, it was posted in a newspaper. Oh, you know, yeah. The school was, you know, you are on this blacklist, and it was horrible. And, uh, and we did everything we could. We, we finally got off the list because the, the grades came up. But when you think about it, this was one day, a group of students who may not have been the strongest group of students, mm -hmm. might not have been feeling well that day, didn't do very well. The following year, another set of students, totally different, better day, stronger group, did very well, and it looked like we did great. Mm -hmm. Is that how you see this? Again, they've it's a snapshot. They've changed the way they identify districts. Mm -hmm. So now they're looking at districts making growth so as long as your students are making growth they're not stagnant or going backwards exactly um, again it's not a per it's not a perfect system as far as we don't you don't use your annual physical to you know you don't actually take that information and think about it every single day but when you go to the doctor's office if you go there and your blood pressure is spiking you're going to do something about it and you need to have that and I just go back to that we need to have that annual check we know that there's going to be natural um, things that happen a student that's sick that day or tired we're not we're never really looking at it at an individual student level we're looking at it the overall picture of health the overall picture of our district okay. but the parent who gets the report that says my child in fourth grade uh, didn't do really that just had a little tiny growth mm -hmm. how do you explain that to them well they're gonna say my kid is failing my kid is not doing well or how, what's the what's the conversation the conversation is um, is with the parent about a number of different topics I mean okay. you'd have to look at you know the student anxiety or so it's the test, the assessment, we'll use it, Such we're a not going to call it test, the assessment, mm -hmm. just a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it's just a small piece. And what we use when we talk to parents is not just that one um, number because that would be, I mean, again, like you said, it's only one day. We have a lot of data. We have student work. We have other assessments that we give that we would have that discussion. And I guess it's more of a, we, we hope that it's a collaboration. If we have a parent that's concerned about their student score, we welcome them to come in and discuss it with us. And we'll give them our true evaluation of where we think they are. And you know that there's a lot of services and different things that we can provide mm -hmm. for students. If we determine that it is truly a child not making growth, then we want those parents to come in and we want to have that conversation. But again, if we didn't take the test, we'd never know. I mean, if, if as a parent, I want to know if my child's not making growth because there may be other things the child needs. And a lot of times that helps us. It's one, you know, like I said, one piece of the puzzle, but it helps us kind of determine what we need to do long term. Um, so what kind of items are on this assessment? I mean, is it true, false, fill in the blank? Uh, write a paragraph. Is it like the reasons exam, where it's very involved? I mean, I mean, well, the, I, not, not in, you the, don't have to go the great detail. Um, the assessments are modeled after they, they include the shifts that we're seeing. So mm -hmm. you're going to see additional nonfiction. You're going to see students required to really dig into um, a math problem mm -hmm. and not just cool. solve the problem, but also um, they need to be able to explain how they got the problem. So it takes showing your work, <laughs> and it okay. you know makes it a lot. Um, we need the students to not only to just show their work, but to explain their work. So you'll see assessments that match those shifts um, from the standards. Okay. I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all this, and I'm thinking, 
my my granddaughter, my grandkids are in school now. None of this, to me, sounds very threatening mm -hmm. compared to what I've known over the last 30, 40 years of education in, in my career. So why are people opting out of these things? I've seen school districts that are saying, parents, if you want to opt out, that's your right. Is that, is that true? Can they opt out? Parents can say, no, we don't want our kids to take it? Um, yes. That seems silly. I they can, they can opt out, um, but the district cannot. Okay, so and everybody's in. If you think if you think about it, like decisions that are made based on those assessments at the state level, um, they they use those assessments. So when you have students that aren't taking it, it kind of changes your data. But why? Right, it's going to skew the data. Mm -hmm. It's going to. It's it, not. It doesn't give, give a you a true picture. picture. It doesn't go. give you a true picture. I, that's the bottom line. I don't know. I really don't. There's so many. I couldn't even start to talk about the reasons why people want to opt their children out, or the reasons why teachers and school districts are um, against it. It's a very small small portion of our year. Mm -hmm. We spend, there's three days for each assessment. Um, I think for each, it's about an hour and a half each day. Um, we do, at, at our school, we spend um, one day doing what we call a dress rehearsal, where the students kind of run through the process so that they can that's a good see idea. what the experience is like. Uh, they can tell the person that's reading their test they have bad breath. They can, <laughs> you know, they can say that the, n the room that they're in is too distracting. Too we, cold, we, too hot. They create a testing plan that mm -hmm. kind of get, they think about strategies. But other than that, we do not, we teach our curriculum. And I think that comes from having a, a culture where we know that this test is only one piece of the picture in the puzzle. And so, um, we just have to remember that the, this is about the students in the room. It's not about the adults in the room. When are these tests? Uh, they're, the, they're coming up. Coming up, I think, in the middle 14, of April? 14th, 15th, 16th, and the 22nd, so the next two weeks. So if I'm a third grader, I take the test on one day uh, for math and one day for it's English? Three days for English and three days for math. What the heck? Three days to, t to be assessed. So, so if I have a bad day, the other two days could be good days. Mm -hmm. So that kind of evens it out a and bit. And it, it makes it so that it's less, you know, you're doing an hour, approximately an hour that each day. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going through the SATs and you're grueling and you're sitting there and sweating it out. The message we send to the kids is that this is, this is just an, a way for us to know how we're doing. We expect them to show grit and try their best. Mm -hmm. And when they're done, they're done. How about tips for parents as far as getting the kids ready? What should they be telling them and doing, you know, the during that week? Well, I always think that the best way to prevent anxiety is to not create anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really hard for kids. I hear, I sit with the kids at lunch and I hear students talking about failing or I, I think they, and I think I was quoted in the paper, they hear in the media kind of what's going on and kids opting out and it really scares them mm -hmm. it makes them bigger than they are because we try to downplay them we don't right. talk about them during the year so the best thing you can do is get your child a good night's sleep sleep well good breakfast tell them to do their best and but you'll love them no matter how <laughs> they do right? <laughs> right that's what i tell my children i said hey i want you to do your best okay. Just that's all i care about so let's leave it there Folks, you've been watching Chautauqua Sunrise. My very fine guest has been Dr. Lauren Ornsby, the school superintendent of Ripley. And we've been talking about Common Core, and you've been giving us some really good, sound advice. And uh, thank you for your explanation on all parts of this. Mm -hmm. So, kids, if you're watching, don't eat Easter candy the day before or the night, morning before. Get a lot of rest. Get out there and do your best. And uh, don't sweat the small stuff. I'm Doc Hamels. We're going to get together all over again next Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, thanks, Lauren, for being on the show. We'll bring you back maybe next year and see how it all went. Okay? Happy Easter. Happy Passover. You take care.